a few years. Hey guys, this is Bill Manning and Stephen Wallace with Studio C41. We just wanted to reach out to you guys and let you know, hey, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, all those outlets. On uh, the YouTubes. So it helps us out and, uh, you know, spread the word. Uh, yeah, rate us on iTunes, subscribe on there, you know, uh, share it with your friends, your enemies, whoever you want. And go out and shoot some film. Dang it. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Hey everybody, this is Bill Manning and this is Studio C41. And we are in Kate Lamb's studio here in Atlanta. How's it going, Kate? Good. How are you guys? Doing good. Yeah, doing, doing pretty well. So um, last episode we had jordana and we kind of uh, mentioned you and at the end of the episode and how we were really excited about talking about tintype and uh, um it is a very cool art form uh that's not talked about and so we're really going to be diving in and talking about that so we're really excited and this is our first on location recording too so that's a that's a big deal so i'm excited you know hey thanks for having us here in your studio of course i'm happy to have you guys here yeah so you know we get to help break this action in because you just moved in here not too long ago. yes yeah we just moved in and so we're trying to get um situated and where everything needs to go type type thing and then we're gonna have an opening uh party gathering whatever you want to call it on december 1st shindig yes yes that's a good <laughs> word for it opening shindig cool yeah so um, we're going to kind of jump into the news. We're going to move really quick in here, and then we're going to get straight to Kate because I know a lot of people are jumping in here, and they really want to learn more about uh, wet plates. So, oh, yeah, oh, myself done. included. Oh, same here. Very so, cool. Um, all right. So, um, it's a little bit of news for me. So, yeah, what's been going on, Bill? Uh, so, I shot um, some Portrait 800. I know on episode nine, I think, where uh, we were talking about no. Yeah, was it? Episode, yeah, episode, yeah, episode nine. nine. It was just the two of us. We were talking about the slide film. Slide film, which coincidentally we somehow got into that rabbit hole of portrait. <laughs> they, <laughs> we kind of totally... tend to go down a lot of uh, <laughs> just like a lot of random tangents. So yeah. So um, so you suggested that I go and shoot it more, and so I bought a roll off of Michael, and um, I threw it into my Mamiya Seven, and uh, went up to the North Georgia Mountains and into the Nantahala national forest and uh shot around with it and uh i gotta say i'm really really impressed with uh that film and i think a lot of it has to do with, like i was expecting it to be super super grainy yeah yeah but i think because i shot it on six by seven um the surface area was so much larger and the grain was not as bad like as i was expecting and i did overexpose it because then i remember you were telling me that it's light hungry oh yeah you can't shoot that film at like 800 and no. expect like really nice colors to it no so i i metered it uh i set it to iso 600 640 right around that area and uh, um and just metered for my shadows and i, I couldn't be more happy uh, I was really impressed with uh, how that audio or <laughs> how that audio. <laughs> uh, I was really impressed on how the images came out and um, the colors on it are just fantastic. So, yeah, you showed me that stuff you shot, man. It looked gorgeous. Yeah. So, uh, you guys, I'll, uh, I posted it on uh, Instagram, but uh, I'll, I'll post it again along with this episode. So, if you guys are interested in taking a look at it, uh, the colors are super awesome it, i felt like there was a little bit more depth because it is an older emulsion so the tonalities that i was expecting out of newer portra weren't there but i, uh, I liked it it's almost in some ways it's kind of closer to ektar than it is to the current portraits mm -hmm. as far as like limited exposure latitude um well more limited it's still color negative film right but um it's also m much more saturated um, so it was really kind of like, I have an old box of the, like an old sample kit from Porcher when they were still making like the NC and the VC oh, cool. and stuff. Yeah. And they have like this little comparison of like saturation and contrast. And they had Porcher 800 as right in between the NC and the VC. Interesting. So like being, I think, or at least that's what they said. It was like, but still on the contrasty side of things. Okay. Yeah. So, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely much more contrasty than, 
uh, like say Porsche 400 or something along those lines. But um, great film. I uh, get a roll uh, if you guys can and uh, and shoot it. Uh, definitely, I would overexpose it by at least half a stop um, just to kind of and then meter for the shadows. Because, I mean, like we said, it's that's the general term is uh, uh, meter for your shadows and um, and expose for your highlight or. Meter yeah. for your shadows so, and then print or print scan for, for your highlights. highlights. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Right. So only when you're doing negative film. That doesn't apply it to slide film yes. if you go back and listen to episode nine. Yes. So um, I love the film. I've been really happy about it. So, um, Stephen, you have a little bit of news yourself, man. So oh, what's yeah. going on? Um, geez. Well, for starters, we got a uh, meetup going on for the Atlanta Film Photographers Group. Um, we are finally getting off our butts and having a, uh, gathering, um, about time. I know, man. Can't it's wait. Like, <laughs> we're all, uh, I think everybody here is coming to it. So yeah. that'll be exciting. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, uh, we're actually going to do one. If you are local here in the Atlanta area or in the Southeast, um, and want to come out, do it. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. If you just search for the Atlanta film photographers group, if you're not, in this area, I probably will block your request to join the group because we try to keep it pretty regional and like just yeah. pretty local. Yeah. But uh, if I do, then just find and message me or something and ask again. Yeah. You know. If- and you know we'll, we'll probably do something on Studio C Forty One. There, I, like I said, I got a, a gazillion ideas that run through my head, and uh, that's, what I'm, like, that's what I'm afraid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> but did you see the link that I sent you? Somebody did it, uh, like a film swap in the film photographers. Yeah, group. where they like shot it and then rewound it, and then somebody double exposed over it. top Ooh, of it. Cool, that yes. was really cool. Yeah, I've seen some people do something like that before. So it's yeah. I, those are the kind of things I always want to do. But then when I get out to like go and shoot somewhere, I want the images to come out. So <laughs> I'll always go like it's like I have all these different films that I've acquired. Yeah, over time, but I never shoot them because I'm like, oh well. I know if I shoot like Tri-X in this situation, it's going to come out exactly the way I want. So I'm just mm-hmm. going to grab that instead. Right. So, but uh, yeah. So anyway, we do have that film, that meetup. We're actually going to hang out and have just kind of like a, uh, a hangout time for the, uh, the film group here in Atlanta and also uh, going to do a print swap. So uh, where we'll actually, you know, be trading if somebody has uh prints of thing, you was saying like eight by 10 or larger, mm-hmm. or if you've got an instant film shot then we're actually going to do some kind of swap. I still need to figure out the best way to get that. So we can, I don't know if we'll do it like a, a, like a, uh, a white elephant type swap or just like, you know, somebody be like, Hey, I like that. Let's trade. I don't know. Yeah. But we'll figure that out. Can you bring more than one print? Yes, actually. I think Kate was the mm-hmm. one who asked that. Yeah. So you can bring more than one print. Um, okay. You just may not walk away with more than one print based on like what everybody else has. Right. So, um, but yeah, we're going to be doing that. Um, the week after thanksgiving november 30th in the evening and uh yeah again details um if you're in the atlanta film photographers group join that or uh check it out there if you're not if you're in atlanta and you shoot film why aren't you in our group Come <laughs> hang out. um so yeah and then uh also speaking of uh other film news uh, let's see for me personally um you talking about portrait 800 made me think i really want to um I want to say it was, was it, no, it was the, was it the flow, phoblographer or somebody posted, I actually posted in a film photographer's group, a really great review of Lomography 800 speed film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I did see, I didn't have a chance to read it yet, but I did see you and I can't remember. Who Scott and I were Scott, kind of yeah, talking, talking about, about it. Yeah. That's the one film like Lomography. I always kind of give it like just, um, take it with a grain of salt because some of their cameras and things they've come out with have been great. And some are just cheap crap. Yeah. Um, but their film has always been like, okay, they're re-rolling other people's film Mm -hmm. and rebranding it. And, uh, but the 800 speed film is the thing I've always been curious about because Mm -hmm. it's different. It's the only other 800 speed film. Well, now you have Cine still 800 T. Um, but it's the only other 800 speed, uh, daylight film, in 120 Mm -hmm. um so they make it in 120 and 35 and i've always just been curious to check it out and just see how it performs versus like portrait 800 right and um from what the review was saying it's much more like kodak gold 800 or um even somewhat like the uh fuji superior extra like 800 speed film so Mm -hmm. it's definitely grainier but it's got like a different kind of contrast and saturation to it and they said that 
unlike Porsche 800, it really likes to be exposed at 800. Hmm. It really likes that kind of box speed. So I don't know. I haven't shot anything that of yet, that yet, or know anybody personally who's really shot that film. Mm-hmm. But it's cheap. It's like three rolls, something like fourteen bucks in wow. one hundred and twenty. So um, I think I want to get some and try it out again. Yeah. I'll have to find the occasion to force myself to try a film <laughs> that's not my go-to. Well, shoot some film, dang it! I do. It's just <laughs> film that I'm comfortable with. <laughs> but um, so I want to give that a go. But if anybody out there listening has actually experimented with some of the Lomo Eight Hundred, please uh, let us know. I'd love to see what you've got and what your experience with it was. And also, I uh, got some. After talking about Fuji killing off films, I uh, mm. ordered a pack of the uh, Natura 1600, like mm-hmm. a three pack of that, because I really liked the one roll I shot of that. Mm-hmm. And also got some of their Pro Plus 200, which is one of those weird films that they only brought out in specific markets. I want to say just like China, Japan, and Thailand, maybe. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a 200 speed film. It's supposed to be like in between their pro grade film and their consumer film. They label it as a pro film, but. From the images I was seeing, it's just like, it's this strange thing. And it, again, it was cheap. And I found some online and just ordered a five pack of it to just, it's a film I've never shot before. So, so that'll we, that'll probably sit in my fridge for another year or two. And then I'll be like, <laughs> hey, I need to try this film out. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got as far as stuff going on. And then just surviving like fall portrait season, just trying to get stuff finished up and, yeah. you know doing a lot of family portraits and stuff like that yeah or? i actually just shot one earlier today um which mm. uh f- thankfully i'm doing all of that on film so like families cool. kids geez i did like a newborn portrait session on one film the other day which i still haven't skinned in all the film but mm. i'm feeling good about it so let me guess portrait 400 yes there was Yay. largely portrait 400 there was some tri thrown in there actually cool. Did some Tri-X push to 800, which nice. is which is really nice. Shooting in medium format on that. But, so you, but yeah, most of it's portrait at 400. Yeah. And since you're pushing it to 800 and stuff like I've always found, um, since we, and this is a good transition, um, talking about episode 10, um, with Jordana's images, um, where there, there was that grain in the shadows and stuff like that, I actually really enjoyed um printing that image for her because the grain actually added texture to the paper that i printed it on and i, I printed it on a canson uh photographic paper. oh yeah those those prints were beautiful uh and i was just like oh my gosh now i kind of want to embrace the grain a little bit more and kind of shoot a little bit more grainy and see what it looks like on paper so it was kind of interesting yeah that's the thing and especially when it comes to black and white and optically printing in a dark room too yeah the grain um, behaves entirely differently than it does in a scan yeah so it's a completely different characteristic um and so if you haven't printed out your stuff you're missing it Mm -hmm. you know even if it is from a scan and you're doing an inkjet print or a print in a wet lab or wherever it is Mm -hmm. it's just it looks different than it does in a scan yeah. and you're going to notice things and different characteristics in it that you don't. Yeah, that's true. So, well, cool. We're going to go ahead and move into the photo news. Um, we, we're, we're going to be a little late on the news uh, today because we really want to get in talk about <laughs> wet plate clothing. Yay! So, um, so anyway, jump in anytime, Kate, uh, we've got some really cool topics here. Um, so the first thing that we have here is, uh, reflux they uh you know it's kind of funny i had at one point i was like reflux (laughs) (laughs) sorry sorry reflux oh man anyway so um they have reached so the kickstarter went off the details came out in between the episodes and uh uh we are now getting some more information about it but at this point now this recording so we're recording on wednesday um they are already funded and they're like 130 percent funded yes uh and they had stretch goals already put in place and they're fast approaching them um so we'll give a little bit of details on on the camera here so essentially what makes this camera essentially it is the first film lslr to be made in 25 years Wow. That's what they're claiming. Well, the first fully manual. Yes. Yeah. Full, okay. Because like the Nikon F6 came out in 2000. And it's still available for retail. Yeah, it is. I'm trying to think. It came out in 2006. 
Guano Canyon brought out the Elan 7N in 2004 because I yeah. bought mine new just after it came out. Okay. So uh, what's really cool about this lens, or excuse me, about this camera is uh, the lens mounts. So um, not only is it an interchangeable lens, but it's interchangeable mounts, which is really cool. So you can actually change between M42. Uh, I think that's the old screw mounts, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's That's kind of the precursor to the M mount. Yeah. So there's like old, there's even old Leica glass and stuff that's M42 mount. Yep. There's old Pentax lenses. Yep. You can get a lot of lenses that are dirt cheap for M42. Yep. Uh, so you have the Nikon F mount, uh, Olympus OM, Canon FD, and Pentax uh, PK mounts. So I, I never shot P- Pentax. I didn't know they called it PK mounts. So. Yeah, neither did I. I just thought it was, thought it was K mount. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people were quick to jump on Reflex um, was there was no mention of their Rokor MD mounts which is also known as the sony e-mount today um is that's the same mount yeah dude i had no idea that that was the same mount because yeah. i thought it was like a totally kind of abandoned mount when minolta came up with the maxim their mm-hmm. autofocus system no you can you can mount a uh old md lens up all the way onto the sony alpha like any of the e-mount cameras yes so like yeah. the wow. you know like the 799 things, i think like you know yeah, yeah. So, dude, I had no idea that those yep. were the same mount. Yep, that's crazy. Yeah, so I uh, learned something today. That's so, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, I'll learn more than that. But, hopefully. Yeah. So I knew it, and you did it. Ha ha! I win. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, so what's really cool is uh, reflex. I'm really trying not hard to say reflux. Um, so <laughs> reflex is said that they're going to put in their stretch goal to come up with the MD. Uh, lens mount and they are fast approaching that uh, so I do expect them to reach that stretch goal um, and so there's a lot of other cool features other than just uh, the interchangeable lens mount uh, it also has interchangeable daylight film backs which wow. that's crazy cool that's just never happened in 35 millimeter yeah um, I mean I was talking a little bit before we started that uh you had some cameras that had removable film doors Mm -hmm. and you could put a Polaroid back on it for testing exposure. Right. Guaranteed it would be like a 35 millimeter size frame on a piece of peel apart film. Right. Um, But really just for test sake. But you could never stop mid roll because it wasn't even like the roll part. It went just kind of over the shutter, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of window. And the funny part is, is um, I have, so transitioning from digital to film i'm like oh my god you only have 36 frames <laughs> now you're in a camera with only 10 bill yeah i know oh. but it, i'm struggling to to do 36 frames and literally just about any time that i do 35 millimeter that has 36 frames on it the last 10 frames are probably going to be of my cat <laughs> <laughs> so i'm, I'm just saying I mean, if that's i'm not not a bad thing no, no not at all no You're... i just have more pictures of my cat than probably like actual work <laughs> that's content. totally fine i'm cat pictures are completely welcome here you know actually speaking of cat pictures um because i'm derailing this so i came across an edward weston picture called uh mary on a clock okay and i've absolutely loved that image and uh what's really funny is that my wife is like, oh, I love that image. Can you find it and get a print of it? I'm like, ah, it's an Edward Weston. <laughs> I, no, I'm not going to be able to find it. And if I do find it, it's going to be probably worth a lot of money. So it, I, out of curious, curiosity, uh, if you guys know uh, where that print is, and if I can't, so nobody's I'm probably not going to afford it. I, I, I just know. But anyway, so... I, I found out that Edward Weston loved to take pictures of cats. He has, Interesting. Yeah, he had a lot of pictures of cats, and I kind of chuckled because I was like, oh, he totally fit in in this era right <laughs> oh, now. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's like, oh, here's another picture of my cat. Dude, he's now ahead I'm th- of his time. Now I'm thinking about getting yeah. Weston prints because I'm trying to think, unless you have an estate that's really proactive and releasing, like, you know, um, like the Ansel Adams estate that's really great about releasing these kind of uh, – the prints from the plates like that aren't the actual like mm-hmm. negative prints but you could get like a beautifully printed ansel adams poster of almost right. any famous image you want mm-hmm. yeah. that'll cost you like 20 bucks mm-hmm. um unless you have an artist estate that's doing that yeah you can't really find a print no 
So I'm just curious because I did huh. find it on a website where you actually had to pay to see how much that auction went for. Oh. So I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, then that's, if I got that's called, an original. If I have to pay yeah. to find out how much it was, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to much. afford it. Yeah. So <sighs> anyway, so that's just the side note. Um, so back on to uh, onto the reflex. On, back to the reflex. Uh, so interchangeable film backs. I really like it because, I mean, yes, you're not wasting film at that point. And you say, you know what, I'm going to go with, I don't know, throw Fuji 400H in there while I got Portra in this one. Yeah, man. Swap it out. I mean, that you know. would have been useful to me. I had a shoot a couple weekends ago where yeah. I had Portra 400 already loaded up and we started shooting inside where I would have oh, loved yeah. to have some uh, Cine Still 800T instead. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, fortunately, the images came out well just because I hoped for the best and just overexposed the crap out of it. Right. And that is the thing if you are ever shooting in incandescent lighting with daylight balanced film just overexpose it at least by a stop or two it's much more forgiving to correct that way yeah but mm. that's just you know just me being a know-it-all yeah <laughs> um but yeah man that would have been useful i don't think i would use that option often yeah like i mean even my camera like my rb67 i don't change film backs on that hardly ever mm -hmm. but it's whenever i do it's really nice to have yeah well, I think it's also helpful, too, because if you're shooting a lot, like, let's just say you're shooting a wedding, like, I, I've done some film at a wedding and everything, and having, so I had my, my AFD, too, and it was so helpful, I'll go through, I'll do 15 shots, and then I'll drop that out, hand it over to my second shooter, she'll load it up while I'm already putting on the second back, for, uh, so I would have three backs loaded with like portrait 400 or something like that yeah for sure so that, that really helped work for that really that i mean yeah. even yeah. on like my pentax uh 645 where it's just the inserts yeah it's super helpful like i've got and we were talking about shooting film at weddings i've got like four of those now and oh, that yeah. cuts my on my time like significantly yeah i don't have to be trying to re-roll film every time it's just right. popping in a new insert mm -hmm. yep. so that that's a good point that would be really helpful to have multiple of those and they don't seem that expensive actually no. for all things considered yeah so, um, but uh, yeah, man, it's, I'm, ex I'm crazy happy this thing got funded. Yeah. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> What's that, Bill? <laughs> uh, this is actually a open source camera, which I, I was like, what the heck? Me being a techie, I understand what open source is. So from my understanding, and if I'm wrong, please correct me on this, but um, this camera the hardware and software will be open source so that you can actually pull the information and um, mod it yourself. So if you got like a 3D printer or something like that, and you want to make a change on this camera, you can do it as well as the software on this camera. Because, yeah, that is something interesting. Even though it's a manual SLR, um, even like manual film advance, it's got a crank to it. Right. There's um, a well, it also has app capabilities. Exactly, I was gonna say yeah. there's there's these computer controlled uh, capabilities to it, yeah. and that's the thing that I think is really cool in this Bluetooth app that they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It creates um, exif exif data. Yeah, so you can actually record your shutter speed and your aperture yeah. and yep. everything. Right then, you don't have to like be jotting it down in a memo book or something. Exactly. So th this is a brilliant camera. Um, yeah, it's really, really well thought out and engineered. I mean, even yeah. like the fact that it has, even though some people scoff at having a flash on a camera, yeah. I always go back to, uh, there was a great old school writer. He wrote for Pop Photo and a few other magazines. Um, his name was Herbert Kepler. Go look him up sometime. He's awesome. You'll get a hoot out of him. He got very, got, got very old man about his posts mm -hmm. and just kind of like being straight and blunt to the point without really caring about offending people and it was fantastic yeah. yeah but his whole thing was hating that any professional camera didn't have a flash because he said you know i'm bill scoffing at it right now yeah but like having a pop-up flash should be on every single camera i agree yeah because it's silly why would you not have that capability just to have that extra little i i hardly ever use a pop-up flash and herbert would talk about this stuff like you know, I've maybe used it five times in the life of a camera, but those five times it made me get an image where I wouldn't have been able to exactly. otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, I love that they have a flash built into this and then they yeah. also have an LED video light basically. Yes. Oh, good. Continuous lighting. Yeah. So, and that really does appeal to a lot of contemporary film shooters who are shooting weddings or things where they don't like to use flash. They like to have a continuous light mm -hmm. instead. Right. 
So um, it's... Well, and I think it also helps with focusing. As oh well. yeah, if you're like in really tough low light situations, dude, absolutely. Like Instead of pulling out your phone and using your flashlight, yeah, I've mm-hmm. done that a million I've, times. I think we all have. <laughs> Been so, there. You know, here, here's the cool thing. So uh, I did not know this, but Silvera is one of the primary partners on this. So um, congratulations to Silvera on on successfully partnering with uh, getting something funded. Um, so guys, now that you've already been satisfied with funding reflex, well, why don't you go ahead and throw some Silbera film into that reflex? Cause they're not funded yet. And yeah, they're, she's as far when we recorded this, I want to say they're only 28% funded, Yeah, which they're doing Indiegogo. So they'll get money out of it no matter what, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. I like, I like that, but they it just makes it it, so much harder on them because it's just now they get they got an uphill battle every single step and they've been pretty upfront about that they're doing this no matter what exactly Mm -hmm. i mean they've been we talked about they've been a chemical manufacturer for years Mm -hmm. now they're just wanting and they're already making small batches of film but they're wanting to be able to automate the process and um get it much more um uh, on a larger scale yeah Uh, so you know and then be able to start making 120 film too yeah um which is definitely a it's a unique challenge in itself it's not just as simple as taking a bigger piece of film and great you've got it but the whole being able to get the setup for actually having the backing paper and rolling Mm -hmm. it it's Mm -hmm. so much more it's a totally different process it really is and it's so much more you wouldn't think it but it's so much more laborious than just rolling than even like slitting and perforating 35 millimeter right. film exactly that can be in a very consistent like quick process but right. like the you know individual rolls of 120 those all have to get a piece of tape on every single one yep. and you mm-hmm. know so yeah there's a lot that goes into that yeah but um yeah so Barra, i um there's a couple different guys uh i'm trying to think mike um mike padua actually did a uh who does uh, shoot film code? There's like a lot of patches and pens mm-hmm. and stuff. Got some on my bag right now. He did a great post about these Kickstarters and how the film community just needs to put our money where our mouth is. Right. And that's, I cannot agree more. I mean, his thing was even if you can't, like the reflex to get the camera is like almost $500. Yeah, that I was about to say it's 350 British pounds, which comes out to 460 US dollars. Yeah, so it's not cheap. And yeah. I can't afford that. Like, I can. I could buy one of those. I have no reason to afford that right now. Right. But I still, part of me still wants to go and even just throw them five bucks because I think this is important that this stuff is happening. I don't want to see it continue. I don't want to see the message. Hopefully somebody, maybe somewhere in the industry is paying attention and actually seeing there's Mm -hmm. a demand for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Silbera and any other thing coming out. Like if we actually, it's to even just forget about getting a Kickstarter reward, just Sending in like ten, fifteen dollars to right. say this matters to me, mm-hmm. I think is incredibly worthwhile. But yeah. with Silbera, we've talked about it before. It's like including shipping twenty five dollars for like one of their cheapest perks, right. and you get some unique, awesome film like that's going to be delivered this December. I want to say right, yeah. The and they push out some new perks as well that uh, including some chemical. Yeah, yeah. I, I I signed up for the thirty five millimeter one. I'll yeah. Probably go back and sign up for the one twenty one now too. Cool. They keep. The less, the more time that they're not getting their goal, the more I'm actually ordering from them. So, for my wallet's sake, please go and contribute to Silvera's uh, crowdfunding. Yeah, I mean, I've I've already put in some because uh, I was I was really convinced on that Pan 100, just how clean those oh, images it's are looking. Gorgeous film. Yeah, so I went ahead and got that one in the 160 pack. Just you know, hey, yeah, it, it's 15 bucks. Like, and that's that's the thing about this reflex camera that. Um, I was really hesitant about it's like even though it's has been funded, they're getting the money and everything, but they could potentially run into other problems where oh, yeah. everything could totally fall through. There's always there's unforeseen stuff, right? And that's the thing that that really resonated me with what Mike was saying. That so don't give them five hundred dollars of your money. Give them ten, right? You know, like if it's something like, I, and that honestly, I just don't know why I'd never thought of there's that first option that's just contributing money and not getting a reward that yeah. like never right. crossed my mind to be like, Oh, well I, there's no rewards that I want that are that cheap. Yeah. No, I could actually just support this for the sake of supporting it. Right. Mm-hmm. So well, well, it'll be interesting. Uh, if reflex makes it out to retail, I probably will buy one um, because I do have um, some F mount and uh Rocor 
uh, mounts. So if it gets out to retail, I'll, I'll feel a little bit more comfortable at that point. Um, I just, at this point, I'm not ready to pony over. And, it was you know, bucks and it. that's fine. Like yeah. I said, I don't have any need to get one myself, but I'm crazy excited that Same it's here. funded. Peel Apart film is going, it's gone. Um, it's really sad that it is, and I love Peel Apart film. Um, it was some of my first exposure into instant film and Polaroid, and it's beautiful, and I still am trying to, like, hoard up some Fuji FP100C that <laughs> will last me as long as I can, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, Impossible... Excuse me, I keep calling them Impossible Project. Polaroid Originals you, now. You're wearing the shirt, man. Dude, I know, but I'm not wearing my <laughs> Impossible Project shirt, you know? <laughs> this, um, so... Uh, Polar Originals actually announced, made a formal, you know, post on their website about the state of peel apart pack film. Um, and actually saying, so this is for the type 100 cameras, the precursor to the integral film, something that's been around for a while and loved by a lot of people, but, um, they just came out with it that they are not going to be able to make this and they're not trying to. Um, it's been, um, as soon as they came out with the, oh, we're, you know, a part of Polaroid right now, Polaroid Originals, everybody's like, okay, awesome. Everything Polaroid is now going to mm-hmm. come back just right. instantly. And it's never been as swim- simple as flipping a switch. Even for them doing yeah. the impossible film, they had to reformulate everything. But they were fortunate enough to get the machines f- to make the integral film, right. yeah. and which is what made of, it all happen. And a lot of the companies that... Uh, there was like a ripple effect. Oh Polaroid yeah. All was the, going out of the business companies that the company made the raw work. materials went mm-hmm. out of business. Yep. So all of that stuff they had to even making batteries for it. They have to make a new battery for yep. that. Mm-hmm. But, um, so with the peel apart film, they weren't able to get any machinery. Yep. Um, even they tried, uh, doc caps tried to get the machinery from Fuji and they had already scrapped it. Yep. Um, as soon as they decided to pull the plug, they wrecked it all. Yep. Um, so the machine is just not out there and it would be a gigantic undertaking. And they just, I mean, it sucks and it stings, but I'm good on them for just being Getting upfront about there. it. Yeah. Yeah. Just ripping the bandaid off. Just saying yeah. like, we're not going to do this. Yeah. We will love it. And we know a lot of people love it. And there's some amazing cameras that are going to be just display pieces or yeah. have to be heavily modded to use other films. But, uh, there's just, it's not feasible to do it. If you go to, uh, Polaroid originals website, you can actually read the full statement from, um, Oscar, their CEO. Um, here's a little excerpt of the uh, that announcement from Oscar. Um, we're going to post the full link to it, and you can also just go to PolaroidOriginals.com for it. But um, he said that bringing back integral film from the dead was a task that took nine years and more investment and effort than we could have ever imagined when we started the Impossible Project in 2008. When we started our work on integral film, we had full access to the original Polaroid machines, which we still use to this day. To tackle pack film, we'd be starting from scratch, investing in the design and invention of new machines and processes in a project that would take years to complete, requiring huge investments and resources we just don't have. I can't blame him for that. No, not at all. I mean, I'm honestly, I'm proud of it, and I'm really proud and glad that they're not overextending themselves, and they're not like putting something that's just going to ultimately be let down. Yeah. And... You know what? It's just made me want to shoot and buy more Polaroid Originals film because if I want them to do something else in the future, then the best way to do that is to support them now. Yeah, but to pay for it basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And th- that was always the thing. Like Impossible was always a work in progress, and it's always been improved. And I think they're still going to improve the Polaroid Originals film too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I have closure with that. Every door that closes, a new one opens, right? Yeah, for so, sure. And and that's where this transition uh, for Resivo. Um, What's really great is that their insect spec uh, that uh, it would be designed to fit on uh, the Polaroid film pack mounts. Yeah, on certain cameras. There's, right. there's some cameras like the Mamiya RB and RZ67, um, the Mamiya Universal, also yep. the Polaroid 600 SE, which is the same camera, yep. um, that have the ability to use um, instant film backs, mm-hmm. um, Polaroid backs, peel apart backs now. Yep. Um, and there's some also like the the Hasselblad 500 series um, and right. even 4x5 view cameras yeah. that can use those film, film backs, pack film backs, that mm-hmm. they are basically making something to replace that. Right. And, and it's really cool that uh, they're doing this. I'm a little skeptical that they'll be successful because this is an all in, all or none 
um, Kickstarter. Yeah, and they've been hinting at it. They've been dropping hints on this thing for almost two years. Yeah, and so right now they're funded at forty-eight thousand dollars of the two hundred and thirty thousand goal, and they have, I want to say, roughly forty days left on yeah, it. it. This one's a really ambitious, like funding amount. Yeah, and and, and the tough part is is that it is expensive because there, there's two parts to it. So two hundred nineteen dollars, it gets you a back, but the problem is. From what I've read, and again, if guys, if I'm wrong about this, please let me know on the uh, uh, in the comment section and all that stuff. But to my understanding is that uh, you actually have to have the mount from an, the original pack film back. So you can unscrew that mount and then you can screw it into the uh, reservoir uh, back. Which, you know, it's not that uncommon to what basically all these manufacturers were doing. Exactly. Because, yeah. like, my Mamiya Polaroid back, it says Mamiya and Polaroid on it. Polaroid made the back itself yeah. with the rollers, the whole mechanism and everything. And then Mamiya stuck its uh, camera mount on it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's just how they were designed. So you're basically just doing that same thing yourself. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope for the best for Reservo, but, you know, honestly, I... It, hopefully someone can listen to this and you know throw a little bit of money on it i think that they just like you said it was a little too amb- ambitious and in knowing something i had a friend that worked in um in plastic mold injection and mm-hmm. stuff like that is it's stupid expensive mm-hmm. oh yeah for sure um, i mean and that's where they i think they would want to do 3d printing is just not precise enough for what they want to do right in this and there's also having the moving parts because the thing mm-hmm. about this back that is really cool, unlike right now there's, so bringing Lomography back, they have an Instax film wide back that they make for their uh, their um, Bel Air 6x9 camera that people have been modding and putting on other cameras. Um, like Polar Conversions has it where you can get it to go on a 600 SE and some other mix of cameras. Yeah. Um, but it's a manual crank. It's not like just a button to eject it, which the res resvot reservo reservo whatever reservo. Paul, Paul would have said yeah to you. these guys um <laughs> that they're doing is going to actually be battery operated so just right. like the instax cameras when you hit the button it spits out the film yeah um and the uh way that they have to be modded to fit on there the lomography ones are upside down right. so they come out with the the larger white border at the top Mm-hmm. which it's not the biggest thing in the world, but it's, it's kind of annoying. It's annoying. It bugs me. I want yeah. that border at the bottom. Yeah. So that is something that's nice about these backs is that it's going to have the right orientation for the border. Right. So, um, so you know what? They're making a thing. And I've said before, like, you know, I'm not going to fault somebody for making a thing and right. trying to bring something else to market. That's going to be hopefully useful and good. And I wish them well. Yeah. Um, but I agree. It's, you know, it's an ambitious goal. Yeah. So, well, We'll we'll see what happens. They got forty days. I don't know. And some kind of an angel investor or something may come in and us. You never know. Yeah, so. that's just kind of the point. The Polaroid Originals film though has gotten so good now mm. that I don't mind. It, it was like you know, two thousand, even two thousand twelve, or even just a couple of years ago. It was just not there as far as the quality of the images. So right. it was a huge difference from the peel apart film to that. Right now it's gotten so good that if I want to shoot instant film, I'm just shooting it on a like a, an integral film camera, like an SX70 right. or the One Step Two or something, mm-hmm. and loving the results I get. So mm-hmm. yeah, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm not missing the peel apart as much. Right, fair enough. Um, so we're gonna move on. Uh, sorry guys, I cannot find a good transition on this, but um, the Ectochrome podcast came out and. Uh, this will probably be the only time that I'm going to recommend anybody else to listen to another podcast, not that other than ours. So no, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's a lot of great film podcasts out there that uh, we listen to. Um, so I highly recommend not only us, but listen to to the other ones out there. Um, Kodakery being one of them. And uh, they had uh, a really good uh, podcast um, where they brought in uh, Diane Carroll, Yukobi. She's the product manager for Kodak. Uh, Fred Knopf, who is the uh, project manager for Ektachrome, and uh, Matt Stoffel. Uh, and it's kind of funny because he, he's actually like the web developer and strategy guy, but they, the title they gave him was uh, Ektachrome 
uh, super fan. I think Matt's just like a Kodak <laughs> super fan in general, man. Yeah. Like he always like I, I plugged him last time, but I think last time or maybe the time before, but mm. just go follow him on Instagram because yeah. he's always posting pictures of Rochester and like Eastman Business Park. And yeah. like just like he'll be like, oh, hey, here's a picture of the door to the film sensitizing division. That's yep. where magic happens. And yeah. I'm like, Matt, you make me want to come live in Rochester. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he's – and you just listening to that podcast, Matt is super just enthusiastic and excited, mm-hmm. and he's somebody who's very passionate about shooting this stuff. Yeah, so and it was, I, I think he reflects what we're all feeling, yeah. and I think that's really helpful for Kodak to really – so what they talked the podcast there it was really just an update because uh, a lot of people are asking what's happening what's happening what's happening yeah because they announced back at CES at the beginning of the year yep. that Ectochrome was coming back and that it was going to be towards the end of this year but it's you know we talked about it before it's not just as simple as pressing a button and starting it up right. again it's, and they gave a very good explanation as to why because they said it was completely new machinery mm-hmm. um, the the uh, even with the new machinery and using the old formula like there were components in the that recipe that were gone oh yeah and it, it's like talking about raw materials not being yeah. there anymore and exactly. then also just managing scale that's why they i i didn't realize this but that's part of the reason they stopped production on it to begin with yeah was they could they just decided not to scale it down yeah like well, the machinery prevented them from being able to scale it down yeah so that was that was the biggest problem was um they were just so big that it would be too costly for them to scale down and and they said we're just going to stop it yeah that was probably like their yeah honestly they're one of their least in demand films at the time mm-hmm and just focus on some of the other things that were like the portrait line and black and white film and everything. Right, exactly. So it, it was a really great um, episode. There was other little Kodak tidbits in there that, you know, the history and stuff like that that I didn't even know about. Uh, for example, they said that uh, the Ecta part uh, they took from the EK, which stood for Eastman Kodak. So I was like, mind blown right i just always thought like ecto was just some cool like you right. know prefix uh prefix that they put on things to, so sneaky yeah. right but so, now like so I'm, simple yeah so somebody's <laughs> like oh you've got an ecta ecta air or like ectochrome or uh shooting some ectar 100 be like and you know what that uh ek stands for eastman kodak yeah impress your friends yes <laughs> so um they the update uh, that they gave on that it was like the whole process and everything but the last bit is that um a lot of people that had asked uh their 2017 roll which is a four foot by six thousand feet over a mile long of uh of base plastic cellulose base and um Right now, it's in a curing process and everything, but before it gets cut up and all that stuff. But it has been made. They it even has, like yes. yeah. Um, the day that we're recording this, uh, you won't be able to see it anymore. But Kodak has on their Instagram story, mm-hmm. like actually showing the start of that process of oh, them wow. turning it on. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I like actually videos of that whole thing of it going, and it's it's pretty fantastic. It's exciting stuff. Yeah. So uh, what's going to happen is. Um, they're going to be releasing a test batch to some internal and external uh, testers. Uh, Matt Stoffel was super excited because he was included on that quote unquote internal user. <laughs> so you lucky bum. Uh, hey Matt, if you listen to us, maybe, you know, a sneak a rollout or yeah, like, you know, yeah. I'll test it out for you. Yeah, for real. <laughs> um, so, uh, but they're only doing limited sizes at first, right? Yes. Uh, so it is only going to be super eight. And in um, uh, 35 millimeter. Yep. Um, so for people that are asking, no, there won't be any plans right now for 120 or 4 by 5 sheet. And the reason being is um, the equipment is totally different for 120. Like you have a certain process where the, the film is loaded and it's, it's perforated and all that stuff. So there's yeah. a very specific role, uh, process, whereas 120 is a totally different set of machinery. Yeah, and they like, don't have it. They like we were just yeah. saying, like it's just it's a completely different automation and yep. it is a lot more laborious than yep. 35 millimeter film, mm-hmm. believe yep. it or not. But um, 
Yeah, they were talking about that, and they go into this on the podcast, but the probably in movie film, it's just 8 millimeter, and then in still film, it's a 35. Yeah. And they're probably going to be the next thing that's going to come out is going to be 16 millimeter movie right. film. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, is the next plan. But, you know, it's all based on, if you want 120 film list coming out, go buy and shoot the 35 millimeter. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. If you want more of this stuff, buy it. Well, not only that, but they said it's for them to do 120 is dependent on how the successful ectochrome is in 35. Exactly. Yeah. So if you guys don't go out there and you're going to try to hold out to 120, you're part of the problem. I'm just saying. So go ahead, just break down, go ahead and get a roll in 35 millimeter and shoot it, you know, just, just, or just buy a roll of it and give it to your friend. Yeah. I mean, do whatever sure. with it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, just let it sit in your fridge for a couple of years like I do with films that, <laughs> that I go to. Shoot but 35. Just go buy some of it for crying out loud. Yeah. Shoot some film, dang it. Yep. So, um, so that's uh, pretty much it uh, for Ectochrome. Uh, go ahead, listen to it, uh, the po- podcast. Uh, just hit that back button on the podcast and then search for Kodakery. And uh, um, not now finish listening to this podcast first and then you go listen to them. So, um, it's also got, they, they do have some quality guests on there yes. too. And they also, I love the fact that they, um, it's not a photography specific podcast. It is Kodak and film specific. They yeah. talk to a lot of cinematographers and movie filmmakers, you know, yeah. too. So, um, there's some really great, just learning the aspects of what it's like to work on film in motion pictures too. Yep. is mm-hmm. really cool. Yep. So that's pretty much it for photo news. Um, So we're going to change up gears a little bit. And uh, we are going to talk about something that was actually replaced by film. And (laughs) and that is uh, tintype, or as we also call it, wet plate collodion. And that is what Kate Lamb here shoots. So tell me a little bit about this. Like, tell me about yourself first. So, uh your history so so i'm kate lamb nice to meet everybody on here um hi kate hey (laughs) (laughs) um so i've been shooting for 10 years now i when my uncle died he left a 35 millimeter just in his storage unit and i had i picked up disposable cameras and so i i just shot with that and then finally figured out the 35 and kept shooting on that for a long time uh, basically until it broke and i was like i can't I can't repair this. I can't get rid of it. I'm just going to save it. And Mm -hmm. now it's on my display case and, you know, it taught me how to take photos originally. And so, um, I just, it was something that I could never put back down. Like I kept going with it. And, uh, eventually 10 years later, I am a wedding photographer. I am about to launch a studio for tintypes here in Atlanta. And, um, so it's, a lot is going on with it and I'm really proud of how far it's come in these 10 years. And so it's been great and it's a lot of change, but it's all good change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how did you transition from film? Like how did you s- discover shooting tintype? Um, so I, my best friend shot tintypes a few years ago when she lived here mm-hmm. and um, she needed an assistant for some things. And I shot film, I, I shot digital. So I knew enough and I shot large format. So I knew enough about, cameras and the process to assist and so I did that for a long time and then she moved away and when she moved away it was kind of like oh I still I still want to do this but at the time I didn't have a dark room I didn't have a place um you know I couldn't afford it because it is kind Mm -hmm. of the initial investment and um so one day or a few years went by and I kind of kept thinking about it and I wanted to do it and Finally, I was like, you know what? Why not? There's no one else doing them here or not very many people doing them here. Mm. And uh, so I just kind of bit the bullet and um, decided to go for it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So explain the process. So um, we're not just for the listeners here. We're not going to get super technical um, about wet plate clothing. So if you're looking for all the technical stuff, honestly, you can find it in a YouTube video and you can watch you know, all the chemical names and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I I didn't want to get into that because this is more about uh, Kate and um, and 
her using this medium and uh, but if you are yeah. looking for a good resource for yeah. that the uh penumbra F- foundation out of new york mm-hmm. is a great really yeah they have uh, yeah they're amazing they're on social media they're on instagram they actually got a uh, geez they got featured on the today show not mm-hmm. too long ago but what's the name again penumbra foundation okay um and uh you oh. can actually you can actually uh they have videos of, you know, shooting and then developing and fixing like tin types. So you can actually see that process yeah. of seeing it, you know, turn from a negative into a positive. Mm-hmm. Cool. So uh, so just with that bit of context, I guess just kind of quickly explain like the, the process from like when you put the clodian on it and then from shooting to developing and fixing and all that. Cool. Yeah. So um, so the way that the so what I'm shooting on is a piece of aluminum. Um, so it's not tin. Yeah, secrets out. Sorry, tin. guys. Ooh. Used to be tin. I mean, um, we call aluminum yeah. foil tin foil still. Yeah, so, you know, and we call aluminum cans tin cans. I mm-hmm. mean, it's very confusing, but it is. it is actually aluminum and not tin. But that's okay. Um, aluminum plate doesn't, or aluminum type doesn't really roll off the tongue. That's true. It's just a little too much, too many M's, you know. <laughs> or with the British, it's aluminium. Yeah, it, it could is. it could get very confusing. <laughs> How about, we'll just call it wet plate. Yeah, wet, wet plate. plate. There we go. So anyway, so the wet plate. Uh, well, it's at this point in the stage, it's dry. Um, so uh, so you aren't shooting this wet. You are. Oh, Wait, yeah. okay. So when you, because um, you have to order the the aluminum, the tin, and um, so that comes dry. It comes coated in a uh, gum, which is what all of the chemicals stick to. Okay, I and, was wondering about that. Yeah. So you're mm-hmm. actually not just like going and buying a sheet of aluminum just off of the shelf, no. like in an art store or yeah. something. Okay. Or, yeah. So um, so that is what is kind of becomes your emulsion, emulsion, and it keeps it. The, the chemicals eat that away to create the image. Um, instead of just like a you know regular sheet of metal, it's actually like black on that side. Um, and so then that has a plastic coating over it to keep all the dust and particles off of it. And so when you are ready to go expose the the, the plate, that you can peel that off and um, then you have like a clean slate. You don't have to like put scratches. your emulsion on and everything. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then so the first step would be collodion, um, and you pour that over, which is what. Uh, that's your step before exposing it to the silver nitrate and um, that ma- holds the silver nitrate onto the plate. And so once the collodion is poured, you can take it into your silver bath and it has to sit in there for a few minutes and that is what makes it light sensitive. So when you put it in, you can do that in daylight, but when you pull it out, you need to be in a red safe a red light safe interesting so space. the silver nitrate itself isn't light sensitive mm-hmm. but when you combine it with the collodion it becomes sensitive yeah mm-hmm. interesting i didn't know that I, I always assumed that the the silver nitrate itself was that, so i was listening to youtube videos all day before we, oh yeah we, we came in here so i was kind of trying to understand it better so that's cool i didn't know that uh the silver nitrate by itself is totally light safe that's yeah. pretty cool mm-hmm. so it's kind of interesting how that all works um mm-hmm. it's a little, a little wild all of this is a little wild so it's kind of kind of fun and that's you know we can go into this more but that's kind of what i like about it is that there are so many um strange aspects to it that mm-hmm. is unique so for some of the people that do know how um wet plate clothing works how difficult was it getting the coverage when you're pouring the clothing on there like is it is it it looks like it's um i want to say like runny like water but it's it's not like i guess it's like very thick. it's a it's not, it's somewhere in the middle it's definitely not runny um but it is a little tacky to it yeah so it's almost just kind of like a syrup mm-hmm is it like a teeny bit thinner than syrup though okay yeah mm-hmm. interesting so what's interesting is like when you pour it like i always wear gloves for this part especially right. um but you can feel it and it feels like it's like cool and when it dries it dries like a flaky pastry almost interesting. which is really strange wow. um and yeah you you can once it dries you can like see it and, and touch it and it won't stain your hands or anything and it dries yellow which is really strange hmm. um it's a yeah it's a confusing chemical but um it's great <laughs> sweet so yeah. So you get it into the silver nitrate bath, and I think it has to sit for like about four minutes is what I've yeah. commonly read. So you, you pull it out and under the safe light and everything, and then you're loading it into like a back. So mm-hmm. 
do you can you use like a normal film back or do you have to get a special back for the for the camera? Um, so what I just use a regular back. I use a mm. regular film holder that um, a company here in the States modified to that it's able to hold um, a wet plate. Oh, cool. So um, you kind of it's a little bit different than like sheet film and that you have the film holder and you have um, one side is designated to be to face the front. So mm-hmm. you have one side of the film holder that's designated for one thing. You can't just like load either side and it's good to go. Um, mm-hmm. So you load it uh, face down. Mm-hmm. So the emotion, emotion of course, will face the front of the film holder. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, he's um, welded little like metal bars that hold the plate in in the film holder. Nice. Cool. Mm-hmm. And again, that is... You have to take the image while the uh, emulsion is still wet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So at this point in the game, the um, the plate is wet and it'll stay wet for the rest of the rest of the exposing process. Cool. And you do have a time limit before you can yes. actually get it into the developer. What is that like? Ten minutes or something like that? Uh, yeah. I tr- I try to do it just kind of mm. uh, faster is better. <laughs> right. And, yeah. And what's um, you can. After you've exposed it, you can go back and redip it into the silver again if you oh, want. Yeah. Um, but and sometimes, uh, depending on the humidity and the weather, if you're shooting uh, outside, you you will have to do that. Especially, yeah, I've found it here in Georgia, just because the weather is so humid, it, it just evaporates much faster. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I usually keep it to under like two minutes if I can, mm-hmm. especially here in the studio. So yeah, you were showing you didn't get to see this yet, Bill, but um, you were showing me your mobile darkroom mm-hmm. setup. Yeah. So how does that work like for because you do a lot of uh, events and mm-hmm. like different things around town here in Atlanta. So how does that work for you like not being in a studio being like kind of out in the world? Oh, it's, I think it's so fun. It's um, that's kind of the challenge that I love about it is just being like I've done an event in a coffee shop and a brewery and just kind of finding like a space that I can turn into my studio as and like come up with different backdrops and, um, you know, meet different people and things like that. But uh, with the mobile darkroom, there's a guy here, um, his company is Lund Photographics, L-U-N-D. And he's amazing. He's the guy that modifies the film holders. He also makes his own film holders so that if you don't want, um, like if you don't have a film holder already mm-hmm. or if you want a very specific, like a film holder that is actually four by five exactly, you can he can make you one and... Um, He's the guy who made my dark box. He made my um, holding tank and and my silver bath holder actually as well. And he's awesome. I can get a link for everybody for yeah. that too. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and so because of the way that he made the dark box, he made it out of a pelican case, and the roof of it is oh, a no um, yeah, and the roof is just a red uh, like um, it's like a red piece of plastic, pretty much. And uh, so that's my red safe cover that it just takes like ambient lighting and I can shoot anywhere with that. Oh, nice. OK, mm-hmm. so you don't have to have like because I didn't even think to look if there was a safe light in the uh, in the room here you showed me. So oh, yeah. No, it's just from the film on top of the uh, the tent. You have mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Cool. So we were talking before about uh, last time about orthochromatic or panchromatic film. So this is orthochromatic Mm -hmm. meaning that it can be you can view the film like in a safe light yeah you don't have to be in total darkness yeah most black and white films are you have to view and you can't have a safe light for having in total darkness so the uh silver bath is in total darkness and so that's kind of um one of the most valuable things about the silver bath that he makes is that um he's found some sort of like a design that works perfectly that props it up and it's completely pitch black in there. So that way that makes that light sensitive. And, nice. You know, you don't have to worry about anything getting exposed or anything like that. So what's your workflow like when you're, say, like at an event shooting somewhere? Is it pretty much like go, you have somebody who comes in, wants to get their portrait, and what happens from that? Yeah, so usually when I do events, um, I'll try to promote it ahead of time, of course. And um, I have a, uh, like, pre-order type thing where you can... Um, pick your time slot and you can like say for example um, if it's a Saturday and Sunday event if you're like oh I've got things going on on Sunday well there's a Saturday slot and it's usually about 20 minutes long Um, and so you that way you know what time to get there and you're not waiting around too much and 
Um, that way you can just come in and you thankfully the person sitting doesn't have to do that much and they can just sit real quick and then I'll run around and do all the things and hop in and out of my dark box, which is always entertaining. <laughs> so yeah, so somebody comes in, they sit down for their portrait. Mm-hmm. Are you going and like, like, okay, cool, you're here. Let me go coat the plate and then come back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So with events, it's a little bit faster process. Um, and I'll usually get the plate coated before, like either right when they walk up or um, right when they sit down or something. Because since it does have to sit in there for a few minutes, it try to efficiency is key there. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'll try to get get that going. So because it can sit in there longer. Um, if it has to. So that way it just kind of helps as far as the efficiency goes. And then um, once it's uh, developed, I can bring it out into the light and show them in the tray of fixer as it develops. So most people get to see their plate actually come from a negative into a positive. And it's really cool, especially for people that don't know anything about film. If they do know about film, it's amazing to be able to watch that like actually happen. Yeah. So that's always been really cool. I saw that firsthand um, at the photographer's studio um, and I was totally blown away. I was like, okay, I know it's cool when you're doing the printing and you put, yeah. you put the paper into the developer and you start seeing the positive come up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And then I saw this and uh, they poured the fixture on, on in the tray. I was like, oh, it's amazing. Is. Yeah, it's really <laughs> cool. What blood magic is this? Yes. It goes from like <laughs> this like blue cloudy thing and it looks like your photo is going to be terrible and you're like, oh my gosh, what did they make? Like, I'm paying for this. And then it comes into this beautiful black and white image um, on a piece of metal. So is there like a curing time? Like when, once you put the fixer, does it have to sit in fixer longer or? Yeah, it sits in fixer for about the same amount of time that's in the silver. So anywhere from like three to five minutes usually. Okay. okay that's not mm-hmm. that much different than like fixing a piece of black and white. Yeah. Paper. Yeah. It's very similar to that. So, and, then, and then you just air dry it or? Um, so then after that, it goes into a water bath um, mm-hmm. to wash off all of this. And uh, so what I do, depending on the event and depending on if I'm at the studio or somewhere else, I have a holding tank. Um, and that's another product that Lun Photographics made that um, I'm able to place the plates in the tank and that way they can just it's just still water that they can sit in and that keeps them protected until I'm ready to wash them. And then I'll wash them for 30 minutes, and then after that, they can air dry. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. And if I am in a hurry, I can dry them with a hair dryer too, but I, you know, it just I depends on the day. Done that in a dark room with a print too. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, shoot, I've done that at home with a roll of film. Yeah. Of course. But uh, Ooh, you're, you're a brave man. Oh, dude, it's not that. You just keep it moving fast. Low yeah. heat, and mm-hmm. you just keep moving back and forth on it. It'll be it's totally actually, fine. It's really cool to watch it dry like and like quickly because Mm -hmm. um you can see the like when it or when it's wet it's still like it still looks a little bit dark and it's kind of like a um like a like a light brown color instead Mm -hmm. of being silver and then once it when you either with a hair dryer or some kind of heater or whatever Mm -hmm. however you're drying it um you can watch the water literally evaporate in front of you and you can get to see the beautiful silver tones of of the tintype come out so it's pretty pretty sweet nice that's awesome Mm -hmm. out of curiosity do you know how archival um tintype is or um so it kind of depends on your um varnishing method like so Mm. what i do is i use a sandrac varnish Mm. to um once it's dry and once i scan it in i then coat the plate with that and so that way it'll be completely archival oh cool forever i think um so so far at least a really long time (laughs) really very very long time um and so so, it's not like i know certain varnishes like polyurethane like mm -hmm. has yellows really badly over time so I guess that would be important, too, as far as, like, mm-hmm. picking the right kind of, like, you know. Yeah. So the varnish that I'm using now, it does make the image, like, a teeny bit darker. Um, just probably by, like, if it was film, it would probably be, like, half a stop, I would say. Um, which I'm trying to work on and trying to find the best varnish for what I'm looking for. Because sometimes tintypes do come out a little bit darker originally. So if the varnish is darker on top of that, I don't want it to be too dark. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's always a trial and error. And Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So that's um, actually a really good segue. How much of, what is the, I guess the kind of homemade aspect or trial and error, you know, process of this? Oh yeah. So, um, so with the chemicals, 
there's a way that you can um, pre-make them, buy, buy all the things and mix them yourself if you want. Um, I went decided to go with a pre-mixed kit through Bostick & Sullivan, which is um, a great place to buy chemicals from. They are amazing. I think they're based in New Mexico, I'm pretty sure. And uh, they've just been awesome as far as like they have the this kit that you can buy that has all the beakers and um, film or not film, uh, the chemicals that you need. And um, they can kind of get you going with an initial setup and stuff. And they have been great to just kind of buy that and run with it. And so that way, that's a good uh thing for beginners especially so that they can know that this the chemistry is going to be right and they just have to do all the other variables that go with it Mm -hmm. so it's one less one less hurdle to getting into Mm -hmm. it so this film you were talking about it before and i was just looking at like you've got some pretty powerful like flashes set up oh yeah like you've got speedatrons that have giant like power packs on yeah um, <laughs> the 4803s yeah that are like putting out a whole lot more light than something like a like an alien bee yeah. or a white lightning mm-hmm. or some mm-hmm. kind of like yeah. self-contained light um is that just because this stuff is just not very sensitive or it's not sensitive um some people try to meter it with like regular iso but it that's kind of um, you can try, but the ISO is technically like ISO one or ISO five or Good something grief. like that. Yeah. So it's extremely difficult. And so I'm kind of more of a like fly by the seat of my pants type person <laughs> where I just kind of like figured out. Yeah. Just kind uh, of learn by doing, yeah, and, you yeah. know, once you find the thing that works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I've actually done a few types with two tiny, uh, alien B 800s and it is possible, uh, and the plate is still, you can still see it. It's not too dark. Um, but it's just, I wanted something, especially with doing events and having clients come in. I wanted something that I knew was going to be super powerful, super strong. I knew I was going to get it in like at the first try or two, um, instead of something that would take like, you know, like with, with the alien bees, when I did, when I did do them, the, the lights were like right next to the person, uh, like yeah, completely right yep. like right on top of them. And so I wanted something that could provide a little bit more space. Um, so instead of just getting a headshot, I could get like a, like a, um, waist level shot or something. And so, well, and those speedatrons, those are like, they're industrial studio mm-hmm. lights. They're made for like shooting all day. every yeah. day. Yeah. They're super awesome. Like I am super happy with them. Um, yeah, definitely recommend those. Cool. Well, um, so the, camera you're using is just it's a regular four by five camera Mm -hmm. yep regular four by five real camera and actually before that i had a speed graphic uh just you know regular old press camera from like the 40s i think or 50s and that has actually been super reliable that one's really great because it's so durable and it's lightweight um when i do travel and when i have been to events Mm -hmm. in the past i've used that and it's just awesome it can take a beating and it's will work every time so what are some of the difficulties that you've encountered shooting on wet plate? So many things. <laughs> uh, where do I start? Um, so thankfully, knock on wood, I haven't had too many chemical issues. Um, I did have one recently where it was too cold, and that was the first time that's ever happened. Because um, normally the issue, especially being in Georgia, is that the chemicals are too hot. And so that um, that is definitely bad. You want to keep your chemicals like at a pretty much room temperature um, so like developing black and white film, yeah. you, you need that same kind of like even 68 degrees or yeah. around that. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in there. Yeah. And so, um, but most of the time I, the issues so far have been with just making sure that I'm getting enough light, uh, on the person and, um, like the, I've had some lens trouble, just like buying the wrong lens, like a lens that I thought would be good and wound up being like I bought a 210 millimeter and it was wound up being two telephoto for what I wanted mm-hmm. um, because I'm shooting people that are much different heights and um, some some people want photos of the whole family or some people just want a photo oh, okay. of themselves. I wanted something that was more like um, versatile and so I went ahead and got a 150 millimeter um, that's 5.6, which sounds like it's pretty open, but I actually want something more wide open. So I'm working on, uh, transitioning a Petsville lens that's a, has a 3.5 F-stop into, um, to being compatible with the sync cord for the lights. So I want as much light as possible. (laughs) It's kind of funny because, um, with four by five and shooting on film, 
really that that uh, shoot shoot. It's kind of unheard of to shoot wide open because mm-hmm. really we're just using that light to get our focus yeah. in on the ground glass. But you're using it actually to shoot wide open as much as possible to collect all that light because mm-hmm. really, I mean, one stop is a huge difference oh, yeah. in in you know your what in at ISO one. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. it, joke around ISO one to ISO two. It's, yeah. it's a huge jump yeah, in one stop. I that's, mean. Would that be twice as much light? Yeah. I don't know if one to two would be one stop. Somebody, somebody, come up with a uh, stop chart from like yes. slower than twenty five. <laughs> Please, Please, yeah, I need that. I would love that. Um, it's probably maybe out there somewhere on the internet. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, well, also I think like the the really thin depth of field kind mm-hmm. of adds to the because wet plates are already have an ethereal look to them. Yeah, right. So having that really shallow focus is probably just got to enhance that. Yeah, it turns out I've seen other people do it and it comes out so beautifully. And I really want I like I love how weird they are and how strange they are. And they pick up all these things like um, I could do the same settings every time and every, each plate would be different. Mm-hmm. So I think something about that is just so unique. And um, I like to cherish that instead of I don't really want it to be clean and I don't want it to be anything other than what it is. And so um, the weirder, the better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like we talked a little bit about alternative printing processes mm-hmm. like cyanotype and mm-hmm. Van Dyke Brown and that stuff. And it's that same kind of thing. Like people yeah. love that process because of the hand painted emulsions, yeah. because of mm-hmm. the inconsistencies and yeah. the uniqueness from print to print. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, um, do you have any difficulties when you're shooting that wide open, like as far as like focusing, like, cause you know, what I've done some portraits on four by five where, you know, you're focusing as close as you can with the mm-hmm. loop on their eye and everything. And then, but like just the ever slightest movement, yeah. Oh, yeah. they're just completely out of focus. And I mean, for me, when I'm shooting four by five portraits, I'm stopping down to like F 16, Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. just, to get that little bit of extra depth of field. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I guess for you, like, what, what is, do you come across difficulties uh, shooting wide open? Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I use a loop to focus, and I just repeat to my clients a lot, like, please, please stay still now. Like, um, I make sure, like, um, I kind of set them up generally, like, before or while the plate's still getting light sensitive, like, light sensitized. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so I'll say, like, Please, like you can, you can relax and move, like talk and still, but you can't. Please don't move your feet, so that way, like I get you in the spot that I want you in with mm. the where the lights are and everything. And then once I'm focusing, I do use a loop because um, I've noticed that if it's if I'm not, like, you know, going in and out of the dark box and going into like um, from the dark box to the lights, just like the general studio lights, and then getting behind the. Um, Wow, I forgot my my dark cloth. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my dark cloth, it's just too much um, light change with my eyes. Mm-hmm. And so I use a loop and I just try to get it as focused as possible. And I do miss it sometimes. Like um, I shot one recently that is just, it's just barely out of focus. But I'm also, also okay with it. Um, right. And it it's kind of more about the spirit of the image that I'm getting than like it being perfectly in focus or not. Although I do try my best for it to be in focus. Yeah. And it's funny. You, you gave it a perfect segue. Um, so why tintype? Like, so you have photographers that do shoot film and they have this love uh, for film and it really does kind of in a way inspire them to, mm-hmm. um, to shoot uh, and come up with projects and stuff like that. So I guess what, what has inspired you in this particular medium? Um, so what I love the most about Tintypes is that in 2017, with all this crazy digital technology and just ev- everything that we can do, it's amazing that I am still able to shoot the second ever photographic process. Like that kind of blows my mind. And even though it's just something that I like invested in and tried for and, and worked towards, like it's it feels like it's an honor to do that kind of mm-hmm. um, as if I'm somehow like like giving credit to the past and like the origins of photography and stuff. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I love it. And I also just love um, the tones of it and how it comes out. And I love watching people's expressions when they see it, their image come out. And, you know, most people just love it just for what it is. They are able to have 
this four by five piece of metal with their portrait on it. And it will stay like that forever. It's something that they can give their grandkids and great grandkids and, and things like that. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So it's almost that, that same impact of giving somebody like a Polaroid or mm-hmm. instant film, yeah. but I think it seems magnified. Yeah. So much more yeah. so. Like with digital, like, um, you know, there's there's photos everywhere. There's cameras everywhere with iPads and phones, and they take great photos, and they do an amazing job. But, you know, memory cards get deleted or they get lost or a phone gets destroyed or, or whatever. Like those seem like they are so much more um, fleeting than a tintype is, and it just seems like really, really special somehow. There's so much more. Yeah, I mean, all those images are so abstract. Mm-hmm. And that's um, – if we didn't – mentioned it but um kind of hinted at it that this is a one-off like yeah. this is not a, i mean you can scan these images mm-hmm. in but the at their heart like they're a one of a kind yeah yeah physical like photo this is it's, it yeah it's mm-hmm. not like you're making a negative and then doing a print out of it mm-hmm. like this piece of metal in somebody's hand that's it yeah yeah definitely what's really cool is um so i studied abroad in france a few years ago before like somewhere in the middle of me assisting my friend and before I decided to start my own like venture into it, um, I was going to like a museum and I found a guy just on the street who was doing tintypes. Oh, no And way. he spoke just enough English for me to be able to get one. And it was amazing. And it was so cool to like just like run across this in the middle of France somewhere. And um, somehow the tintype didn't survive like coming back. And so I, I hate that I don't have the original, but I do have like a photo of it and I have the memory of it. And I was more interested in like just watching him because he had a little cart and a little stand and like he had a totally different setup than I did. And so it was really amazing to to like see that and watch that happen. And um, and I think that other people get that too, just like coming into the studio and and it's a totally different way to get your picture taken than than any other way, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, so there's been like a really big revival in film and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, are you seeing anything? I wouldn't say on the same magnitude, but would you see say that there is like this re sparked interest in wet plate? I definitely think so. Um, it seems to be much bigger than it was even when Kendra was doing them a few years ago. Um, like I know at least uh, the very minimum one other person that does them here. And I know a few people in Tennessee that do it. Um, and then there's Lumiere tintype in Texas. And then there's mm-hmm. more people on the West coast and the Northwest. And so, and especially with uh, Penumbra foundation in New York, they're absolutely amazing. And so I think it's definitely growing and it's becoming more popular. And I think that's amazing. And I hope that, that, you know, that, that continues to grow. Do you have any events uh, coming up? I do have an event coming up. I think it's still in the works, but I'm pretty sure I'll be doing an event at Brother Moto Coffee over in Grant Park on December 17th. So that's going to be really cool. Um, They are awesome guys that are running a DIY garage and coffee shop, and they – um, and it's kind of cool to be there doing that because everybody that um, has a membership there does works on their own bikes themselves. And then this is my own DIY project. And so it should be really cool. Yeah, it's kind of a cool crossover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited. Nice. Well, okay. How do uh, people find out about like that or keep up with you? Where can yes. they find you on, on the, uh, the Internet? Yeah. So um, Instagram and Facebook are the best ways to keep up with me, especially with tintypes and what's going on with that. And um, wild and love photo, all one word, all lowercase, is my Instagram. And that's also my business Facebook that people can find me and find information on it. Um, you can email me if you want to talk more or if you have more questions or, or whatever. Or you just, Or if you want to come get your tintype taken, we can do that. Nice. Yeah, we'll be sure to like post that in the uh, show notes and everything, too. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Well, cool. Well, um, thank you for inviting us down to your studio. Yeah, of this course. Is thank you guys for coming. a really cool place. Yeah, um, seriously. Uh, it, it's something that I have only seen and just listening to the YouTube videos and everything has really kind of like sparked my interest in it. I don't think that uh, my wife will allow me to, <laughs> to go down the the wet plate uh, the path because... At least uh, not yet, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, it, I will say it's a little bit of a big commitment just yeah. with the strange chemicals and, you know, all the equipment that goes into it. I, I And it just keeps growing. I'm, I keep finding things and I'm like, ooh, I could use this <laughs> and I could use that. And yeah. But no, I would recommend it. Yeah, it's very fun. Awesome. Well, uh, 
again, thank you. Uh, we've learned a lot. I hope uh, everybody that's listening to the show has learned quite a bit about it because um, um, even though there's only a few photographers that are doing it, I would say that there is probably, you know, a small handful in each major town or something mm-hmm. like that yeah. that is doing it. And there's yeah. people, too, who go out and, like, do touring, like, events and things. Yeah. So yeah. it's, you know, you can find somebody reasonably close to you who's doing wet plate photography mm-hmm. and yeah. go... I mean, shoot, you can go watch them do it. Even yeah. if, if you can't get a photo made, like just mm-hmm. check it out because it's something I think that has to be seen in person to really experience it. Yeah, it's super cool, super unique, and I think everybody should at the very least come watch and hang out. So that should be cool. So, yeah, as always, if you guys have any uh, questions about wet plate photography, you know, or uh, anything we've talked about in general, stuff you want to hear us, you know, go over on next new podcasts, guests, uh, comments, Root remarks, you know, direct the root remarks <laughs> towards Bill. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'll be nice. Yeah, he will actually. Please um, comment, uh, whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, you know, just uh, go ahead and we want to hear your feedback. And again, if you have questions, if you have questions for Kate, um, go ahead and post them. We'll pass them on. Yeah. It will, uh, I'd love to talk more. She actually, she's smiling while she's yeah. saying this. Too. She really needs it. I really do want to talk to you. <laughs> Sweet. Well, um, so one last thing that um, we've started with, um, we've started a hashtag. We had we like, have started a hashtag. Officially, we officially started like when I did a search on this, there was zero. So I, I'm I'm just saying, and then so I threw out the our logo as the first one. So oh, I'm cool. claiming it. Dang it. Yeah. So uh, it is shoot hashtag shoot some film. Dang it. And uh, Stephen and I, we actually go through those hashtags, and um, w- I thought it would be kind of fun uh, because you know we're having such a hard time filling up time on the show, <laughs> um, where we actually go through and pick out a few photos and uh, we talk about them, you know. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, at the very fun. least, you know, this isn't just isolated to us talking every couple of weeks on here. Yeah. You know, we are active on social media, so. I think it'd be cool even to like repost some of our favorite photos on our Instagram feed. Yeah, Absolutely. So, That'd you know, be great. yeah. And so we'll, we'll talk about it and the uh, person will get a shout out on Instagram. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think that would be a great way for us to engage with the community as we're, we're, we are building. So like I said, we do have the website, we do have Facebook, Instagram and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, include the hashtag on there, you know, we, we go through it, you know, if it's a busy day at work for me or something like that, maybe a couple of days delay, but you know, or, I, I you make know, sure to get into it and, and, and three in the morning. Uh, yeah. That's a pretty good time. Best time to post. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right guys, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up and, uh, we don't have any big news yet for uh, episode twelve yet, but uh, we're where, where are you look where are you looking kind of like shifty at me about things, Bill? Because <laughs> I got ideas. Uh, you've always got ideas. I got ideas. So, all right, guys. Well, uh, thanks again for sticking around with us, and uh, we'll see you guys on the hey, next episode. Shoot some film, dang it! Shoot, shoot some, some film. film. Bye. Bye.